Well, hello everyone. It's so good to see you. My name is Pastor Jason and I'm one of the pastors here at Hope Church. And I'm so thankful that you have chosen to worship with us uh, on, this, uh, on this great Sunday. As many of you know, especially those of you here in the Dayton area, the Southwest Ohio area, today is a big day. Our mighty Cincinnati Bengals are competing in the Super Bowl tonight. And so uh, we have uh, re-spelled uh, Sunday around here. We have spelled it S-U-N hyphen D-E-Y, D-E-Y. And it's an expression that we use here in the Dayton area of who day, who day, who day think going to beat them Bengals tonight. It's going to be nobody. So we're excited about that and just uh, something to, to rally around. It, uh, football, as you know, is a sport that is about conflict. It is about how to navigate uh, all these players on the field fighting over a single a single ball and uh, and and doing so in a way that brings them out about an enormous amount of conflict. Yes, there's speed and, and and yes, there's strategy. But in every single play, there's going to be a certain amount of conflict. And the ability to prevail in the game is to avoid it uh, when you can and uh, endure it when you must. The last couple of weeks, we've been sharing this whole idea of wrestling with conflict. And we've been talking about the different areas of conflict that we see in our lives and we see in our communities and the world around us. We began by talking about political conflict and how political conflict both locally and uh, globally can cause us either to... Um, either to withdraw or to be unnecessarily competitive. But God has called us to operate in a very different way. We talked about the conflict uh, within and how that impacts us and how when we are internally conflicted, it affects uh, and impacts how we treat those on the outside of us. Last week we talked about uh, how you and I can uh, use our influence to leverage others and help others overcome and reconcile conflict. And today we're going to talk about the dynamics of interpersonal conflict. We're going to talk about specifically, we're going to use an analogy specifically, but we're going to talk about the way that uh, when you and I uh, have conflict with others, it's often because we are speaking very, very different languages. Not that either language is wrong, just that language is different. In fact, uh, in, in fact, recently I, I I went and had to switch had to switch my phone over. And if if you've been around me uh, the last couple of weeks, you know that I've just kind of been out of sorts. And uh, the reason is because I, I I'm somebody that do, does most of my work on my phone. So I'm always writing sermons, writing messages, writing notes, sending emails, sending text messages, doing all these things on my phone. And I switched my phone from one operating system to another recently. I, I made the switch from, a, from, a, from an Android platform back to, the, back to an iPhone platform. And uh, here's the thing. Android, Android phones are phenomenal. They can do almost everything an iPhone can do. iPhones are phenomenal. They can do almost everything an Android phone can do. But there's one problem with the Android phones and the iPhones. That is, there are certain platforms where they don't communicate with each other. They're designed to communicate and to operate a certain way with certain programs, and they do very, very well in that language. But if you ask them to do things within the other language, it simply is a nightmare. They can't communicate with one another because, watch this, they have been hardwired differently. And sometimes you and I have been hardwired differently uh, to, to communicate differently than those around us. And our temptation can be that when the other person doesn't quite understand what we're trying to say, we simply raise our voice, thinking that if we say something that they don't understand louder, they will be more likely to hear it, understand it, and embrace it. But sometimes we speak just as Androids and, and Apple sometimes can be incompatible with one another. Sometimes the way that we're wired can almost seem to be that way. And so when we come to the close of Ephesians, Paul is going to use three different relationships to show how you and I ought to relate to one another. How we as, as, as people can relate to one another. 
he begins by using the relationship that is really the foundation of, 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 of nearly every relationship, and that is the relationship between a husband and a wife. And I believe one of the reasons that he may have done that is because that relationship in many ways uh, influences most of us, not all of us, uh, more than any other relationship. It is because it is the relationship that we see modeled growing up. It is the relationship that we, uh, that, that we see the world from. And it is really the foundation once an individual, uh, once an individual gets married. It is, it is the foundation by which uh, most, of the, uh, most every relationship is an extension of. And I understand that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that many people have not grown up with that model. And I understand that many people are in stages of life that they're not, they're not in, that, uh, in, in, in that, that situation right now. But I want you to just, if you can just hang with me and just follow me with this. And here's why. I think Paul is using, I think Paul is using a, an example here that all of us can learn from in all of our relationships. And so I believe that it's this. I'm going I'm to give you the, the, the key point, and then we're going to look at it specifically. And, and, and that is this, that I believe that every single person in our relationships both need to give and to receive two things. Number one, love, and number two, honor. Number one, we need to be able to show kindness and affection and love to others. We need to show honor and respect to others. And if each of those or one of those is missing, it doesn't matter how much we have of the other one. And oftentimes, our breakdowns we have come from a person that needs us to show them affection, but yet we're showing them honor. Or a person that needs us to demonstrate to them honor, but we're withholding that and simply showing affection. So let me show you in these few verses how these relate in the, um, in, in, in the, um, in the example of marriage, but also beyond that, how it really um, impacts every area of our life. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 22. Paul says, uh, verse, let's start in verse 21. Verse 21. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so the wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, and he gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, and having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present, the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, each of you, each of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This morning we're going to look at this idea of love and honor or love and respect being the foundation of all the uh, of all the relationships that we that we have in life and uh and some people it's uh it, it some people often are driven by honor and others are driven by respect and so what is important is that you and i give both honor to people and it is important that we give that we give uh love to people as well and so Paul uh, talks to, to wives and he talks to husbands and he gives some instructions about honor and he gives some instructions about love. Now, let, let me just say a couple things that before we begin. 
when we look at this, we see that honor and love are the foundations of these relationships. He gives some instructions to wives and he gives some instructions to husbands. And let me explain to you why I think he does it the way that he does. First thing, he, he, he gives some instructions to wives. He tells wives to submit to their husbands. And he takes three verses to do that. But then he tells husbands to love their wives and he takes nine verses to do that. <laughs> Apparently, Paul seems to think that he has to spend a whole lot more time explaining to husbands the necessity to love their wives. What, what the wives got in three verses, it took the husbands nine verses to get. And I think that the reason that he does that is because these are the foundations of our relationship. It, uh, it, it, it may appear to some to be archaic and stereotypical. But for the most part, men are driven, men are driven by, historically, by honor. By, um, by courage. By respect. In fact, uh, if, you, if you, look at the, you look at the movies typically men enjoy, oftentimes they're, uh, they're, they're war movies. They're, um, they're, they're movies about sports. They're movies about valor. They're movies about, about honor. They're movies about doing that which is right for other people. They're, they're movies about loyalty. They're movies about, um, about coming through and sacrificing on half. On, on behalf of those that, uh, that look to them. There is something in the nature of a young man uh, that desires the honor and respect of his peers. That's why, that's, that's why when you take your child to, uh, when you take your son to, to, to when, a, when a mother takes her son to preschool and the child gets out and, and, and kisses the mother and says, Mommy, I love you dearly. I love you more than anything else. And uh, she, he kisses her and gives her a big hug and then runs in with the other student. When he's about 9 or 10, the child doesn't do that anymore. In fact, if the mother does try to, try to do that, the, the child will oftentimes get very defensive. Now here's the issue. It is not that the young man, it's not that the young man loves his mother any less. It's that there is something else that is driving him and that is the need to be respected by his peers. Men are driven by nature. Men are driven uh, to, 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 for honor, for respect, for valor. That is the language and the currency men, men use. That's why, that's why with men, oftentimes everything is about boundaries. Everything is about space. Everything is about uh, uh, about honoring the, 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 the space in the area around. That's why the most affectionate thing men say to one another is, what's up? <laughs> that's, that's why when we give each other a hug, we, we, uh, we, we oftentimes put a, put a hand between us because it's a way of showing affection, but also honoring space. Men are driven by, by honor. In fact, let me give you one more. Let me give you one more. It's, it's often said that the reason young men join gangs is to experience love. You know who said that? It wasn't a man. Do you know why? Because children or young, young people join gangs not for affection. They, enjoy, they join gangs for belonging and for honor. The problem is, because men see honor is so important, Oftentimes, they need to be taught, and Paul uses nine verses, that there is something just as important as honor, and that is affection. It may be stereotypical, but it just seems to me from these verses and from the experiences of life, that oftentimes women feel much more comfortable expressing affection to one another than men do. In fact, um, in fact if I, there's, there's a chart. You can Google this. Don't Google it now. Google it after the service. There, there's, a, there's a chart uh, about, uh, about the typical um, movie plot of a Hallmark Christmas movie. 
And it is always, it is always simply, usually the same story. It is about unconditional affection. A boy meets girl. Boy ha, uh, does some sort of a, you know, wood chopping contest. He's in from out of town. He's a big city slick or something, but uh, falls in love. But some conflict happens. Young woman uh, sabotages the relationship unintentionally, and the young man pursues and loves her unconditionally and affectionately. It's, uh, it's one of the things that men miss is the need for, for affection and unconditional love. And so in these few verses, we see that the foundation of relationships are both love and affection. Now, I don't think specifically, I don't think specifically that men only need respect and not affection, and I don't think that women need only affection and not honor. But I think the reason that Paul describes this and, and does it this way is because I think men just naturally understand the language of honor and have to be taught the language of respect. I, I'm sorry. Men understand the language of honor and need to be taught the language of affection. Likewise, I think it's very possible that, that, uh, that the language of affection is much, much more natural to women. And so therefore, in order to relate well with men, they need to be taught, or you know, often it's not as natural to speak in the language of honor as it is natural to speak in the language of, of affection. So I believe, I'm convinced that, uh, that through this, that, that what happens is when you and I have relationship challenges with one another, it is either because um, honor has been violated or affection has been ignored. And it might be both, but it's almost certainly just at least one. And so honor and affection are the foundations of, of the relationship. Okay? The second thing we notice is that this, is that honor and affection can be, can, can, can be very, very challenging. I, I'm, I'm convinced that honor and affection are, are actually, are almost like air to us. We are so desperate and inclined to it that, uh, that we would do almost anything in order to, to have those things. You, you, will see, you will see young men are so, young men, it is so important for young man, a young man to have honor and respect of his peers that he will do things that he knows are not good for him. He will violate, he will violate, um, he will violate boundaries that he has for himself. A young man will, uh, a, a young man will pretend to be something that he's not. A young man would do things that, uh, that he regrets doing simply to save face and to have honor in front of other people. And sometimes uh, a, a, young man will, a young man will pretend to be someone completely different than he, than he really is just simply to have the, the admiration and honor of those around him. And likewise, many times, when we see young women making major life decisions that are not the best decisions for them, you, you, you will notice that they're in a relationship they shouldn't be in. They're making decisions that they shouldn't make. That they're, they're doing things that are, complete, are in complete uh, contradiction of who they are. And usually behind that you can find a desire for affection or a desire to be loved. And both men and women, when, when we cannot get these legitimate desires met in legitimate ways, then we will turn to unlegitimate ways to feed them. Or when they can't be met by healthy people that, meet, that, uh, that, that mean us well, then we will turn to unhealthy people that will, that will mean us harm. Just as the body needs air to breathe, so we, both, so we need both honor and affection 
in order to survive. But here's why it can be challenging. Remember, Paul gives uh, nine verses to men saying, "Love husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. He gives three verses to, 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 to the women and, tells, and instructs the women to submit to their husbands as to the Lord. And, and here's, here's where we get in what um, Emerson Egrich would call the crazy cycle. Sometimes you will find uh, in a relationship that there is a conflict between two of the individuals. And it is because one of the individuals is talking in a language of respect and the other individual is talking in a language of love. So I, I'm just going to make something up right now. S suppose, that, uh, s suppose that you have one individual and they, they really need affection to... They really need affection in order to survive. It is important for them to have someone in their life that shows them affection, that shows them attention, that shows them kindness, that shows them tenderness, that, that goes out of their way to show them that they are the most important person in the world. That, 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 that there's an individual that they need affection in order to survive. And they're in a relationship, and, and in this relationship, they're not getting that. So they are deprived of the affection that they need. And they're in a relationship with someone that is driven by respect. And so when this person isn't getting the affection that they need, they are probably going to do several things. They are probably going, to, one thing they might do is they might go overboard in showing affection to the person that wants respect. The person that wants respect is kind of overtaken back by it. He or she doesn't know what to do, and so they step back. The stepping back, the withdrawing, is interpreted as a lack of affection. So the person that needs affection now is, uh, is feeling even less, um, even less loved, even less nurtured, which is causing this individual to, to push even harder. And so now the individual is, is starting to go overboard a little bit. This, the person that's driven by respect doesn't know quite what to do, and so they, they kind of pull back. The person uh, which doesn't help. So the person that, that needs affection is, is noticing that everything that they're doing is not causing the affection to increase. Now they're starting to freak out. And so they begin to control, but you know that's not going to work. They begin to, um, they begin to, um, they, they begin to nag. They begin to uh, push. They begin to pry. And in each of these, the conflict is increasing but the person that needs, that needs honor more than affection, they genuinely, they genuinely care for the other person. But what's happening is when they feel that they're not being uh, honored, what they will often do is they will withdraw. And by withdrawing, they're not intentionally trying to be difficult. They're just, they're just redraw, uh, redrawing to their own space. But it is interpreted as a lack of affection which causes the other person to get, to get more aggressive. Now the person that just simply feels like they need space and boundaries, now, now they're getting to the point that they're starting to get agitated. Now as they get agitated, it starts this crazy cycle and it goes around and around. And what neither of them realizes is this. What, what neither person realizes is this. The person that is driven by affection can't seem to realize that the other person just simply needs needs honor and the person that needs honor sometimes can't see that what he or she is doing is actually um and showing honor it's actually coming across as unaffectionate and so they're speaking two entirely different languages and they're trying to get along but the reason they can't get along is because their iphones and android And they don't realize that what is important to one is not the thing that's the most important to the other. And that by giving the other person more of what they want, they're actually depriving the other person of what they need. So I think Paul says here, Paul says, okay, let's take a time out. He's saying... He says, wives, 
Real simple. He says, honor your husband, submit your husband as you would to Christ. He says, treat them as you would Christ. But then he gives a much, much greater commandment to, to, the, to, the, uh, to the husband. He says, all you got to do is this. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. In, uh, in, ancient, uh, in, ancient, in the ancient Greco-Roman world, there was, uh, there was, it was legally, it was required. In the ancient world, legally, it was required for the wife to submit to her husband. But it wasn't legally required for the, wife, for the husband to love his wife. So what Paul is doing here in these nine verses, is he's telling, he's telling the husbands, he's telling the men, Listen, you need to do something that's not required by, by the uh, by the Greco-Roman law, by the Greco-Roman culture, and by the Roman laws. You need to love your wife. And um, and 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 I can imagine saying, well, how much should we love our wives? And Paul says, oh, let me just let me just let me just give you an example. Love your wife the way that Christ loves the church. The way that Christ gave himself completely up for the church. The way that Christ doesn't hold the churches, um, do, does, the, the, way that, the, the way that Christ loves the church unconditionally, the way that Christ loves the church sacrificially, the way that Christ loves the church dynamically, the way that Christ loves the church continually, the way that Christ has held absolutely nothing back from the church, in fact, gave his own life for the, for, the, for the hope and the future and the reputation of the church. Paul is telling the men, listen, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything except just love your wives as Christ loved the church. Hold nothing back. And then he tells the wives, or actually before he tells the wives, submit to your husband as you would submit to the Lord. Now, I think that these things can go beyond simply the marriage relationship. In fact, I would even say that they, 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 go, they go beyond the marriage relationship, and I, I believe that both aspects need to be in, um, in every relationship. Both both love and, um, and honor. It's what causes us to, 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 to breathe, to function, to live. It is both of those things. It's amazing. It's, a, it's amazing when you've, seen, when you've seen these violated, the way that it has caused you to rise up inside. There's been a time or two, if you're honest, that you've been in the parking lot of uh, Meyer or Walmart or somewhere, and you've witnessed something that has made you very uncomfortable. You've, um, you, 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 you may have witnessed a, a, a wife just, just giving it to her husband. She's, she, is just, she is just tearing him, he, she is just tearing him up verbally publicly and you look at the man and you're like you know what you, you, you look at the man and you you realize that on one hand you feel that he is so weak because he is taking this abuse from her and then you realize he would be even weaker if he were to retaliate and say the same things back and you've been situations where most of us have been in a situation in a, in a public situation where we've seen a, a man speaking very unjustly, very unlovingly, almost verbally abusive to, 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 a, to a young woman. And we've thought to ourselves, we, 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 we've thought to ourselves this, if, if, I, if I intervene and I say something, I'm not scared that he's going to do anything to me, I'm scared that he's going to do something to her. And also, we've been around long enough to know that in times that we intervene in situations like that, the one that is being abused 
actually turns on the one trying to defend her, protecting her abuser. And the question is, why would she do that? Because the desire for affection is so great. And so we see in our lives and we see in the people around us, we see that this drive to have, to have affection can lead us into the most abusive and hateful relationships and the drive to have respect and honor can actually, can actually cause us to participate in those relationships if we're not careful. They're both. Both honor and love are very legitimate things that God calls us and commands us to give one another. And the thing is, they're, they are they're infinite resources. They're not finite. For me to give honor to someone else does not mean that honor has been taken from me. And for me to give affection to someone else doesn't mean that I have less affection or that I'm receiving less affection. You and, I, you and I have infinite amounts of both affection and honor that we can give one another. And as a general rule, from what I've seen, the more honor we give to people, the more affection we get back. And the more affection we give to people, the more honor we get back. No, notice this. Notice this. Paul tells the, the, the wives, he says, submit to your husbands. But nowhere does Paul says demand Nowhere does Paul says to the husband, demand that your wives submit to you. Because it's completely voluntary. Likewise, he tells the husbands, he says, love your wives, but in no way does he tell the wives, wives force the husbands to love. You know why? Because here, but both, both honor and both affection have to be given unconditionally. And when we give those things unconditionally, at least from what I've seen, we always get the other back. If you want affection, give honor. And if you want honor, give affection. In fact, maybe the mistake too many of us have is because we want honor, therefore we think the way to get honor is to take it from someone else. No, the way to get honor is to give honor or to give affection. The way to get affection is not to... Not to take honor from someone else. And it's not to take affection from someone else. But it's to give honor. And to give affection. Usually it comes back to us. Love and honor are the foundations of every relationship that we have. Lo love, and, love and honor can... Uh, can be challenging, especially we, we get in these, this crazy cycle of not realizing we're withholding from the other the thing that they need the most because we're giving them what we want, not what they need. Finally, we see here that love and honor can be a metaphor. The, the, the example that he uses is the example of Christ. He, 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 tells the, he tells the wives, he says, listen, he says, listen, um, he says, submit to your husband as, as you would to Christ. Because it is a picture of, it is a picture of honor. But then he tells the husbands, he says, love your wife, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, for her sanctification. That word sanctification, it means her, 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 um, her purity. Her um, sanctify basically means to set apart. Uh, it means to set aside as special and to treat nothing else like it. Paul is saying that's what Christ has done for the church. And in the same way, he says, treat your, treat your wife like she's special, like she's set apart, like she's sanctified. And do it with the self-sacrificial um, self love that has no bounds, 
has no limit, has no end, has no delay. If you and I are going to have healthy relationships, and you know, starting in the, starting in, in uh, with, with, with close relationships, but really relationships with everybody, we've got to remember that it's not simply about giving people what we want, but it's giving people what they need. And I've not met a person that doesn't deeply, deeply value both both affection and honor. Both to know that they belong and to know where they belong. To know that uh, that there's security, to know that they won't be left behind. When you have someone in your life, and it may be someone that you are very close with. It may be, it may be just other individuals that you're that you're with, and they realize that you deeply, that you deeply love and care for them. There's almost nothing that they will do for you. And I found that when you and I give respect and honor and encouragement to others, I found that almost always it comes back to us. The question is, how should God's people treat one another? How can we have these foundations of healthy relationships? I believe in almost every scenario, almost every circumstance, that if we treat people with honor and if we show people affection, that we will most model what Christ has done here on earth and what Christ is doing even now in heaven. Father, we thank you because um, in the life of Jesus we see someone that not only received honor but gave honor. Jesus, the eternal Son of God, honored the Father by submitting Him. Even though He's co-equal, he, he submitted to the Father. And in the same way, we know that the Father deeply loved the Son. And that the Father deeply loves us by giving Christ Jesus to die in our place. Father, we pray that You will show us how to show honor and we pray that you will show us how to show affection. And in fact, now that we think about it, Lord, in these verses and in the pages of Scripture, you show us how to show honor by treating people as if they were you. And the way that we show affection is by treating others as if we were you. Lord, we thank you for that model. And we thank you for how you've sacrificed for us. Lord, we love you and we thank you in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Well, I'm so thankful that you've chosen to be with us uh, again today. We're going to be continuing these, this series over these next couple weeks. And uh, I, hope it's, I hope you're finding it helpful. As I, was, uh, as I was wanting to say earlier, that these are just some issues that we see people dealing with throughout their lives. And I'm, I'm convinced even this, this concept of love and honor. Anytime I've seen conflict between two individuals, it's, it's, it's always because either respect has been violated or affection has been withheld. And so I believe if we get these two things right, that, uh, that uh, that'll help us in a lot of ways. Listen, we, we'd love to help you any other way you, you, we can. You can find us by going to our website at hopeindayton.org. While you're there, you can give your tithes, your gifts, your offerings. You can also do that on our Hope in Dayton app. You can download it from the Google Store, uh, the, the Google Play Store, or from the or from the App Store if you have an Apple. Uh, you can also uh, text to give, and of course, you can uh, visit us here at our Wilmington Pike location, 5980 Wilmington Pike. So it's just been a pleasure having you. I'm glad that you're uh, that you've been with us. We look forward to seeing you next week. 
And uh, until then, I would normally say, God bless, but today I would say, Go Bengals. Is our God a bulwark never failing? Our helper, he amidst the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great. And armed with cruel hate On earth is not his equal Did we in our own strength confide Our striving would be the best.